It's Friday, the 12th of April, 2024. The last word in podcasting news. This is the Pod News Weekly Review with James Cridlin and Sam Sethi. I'm James Cridlin, the editor of Pod News. And I'm Sam Sethi, the CEO of TrueFans. In the chapters today, Stephen Bartlett launches Flight Studio. Acast is the number one publisher globally. And... Hi there, it's James Allen here, CEO and co-founder of Media Disco. And I will be here later to talk to you about our new platform, Media Disco, and how it can help mid-market advertisers everywhere. Hi, this is Anu Bardwaj. I'm the founder and CEO of Sheconomy. And I'll be on a little later to talk about how Shikonomy is disrupting the world of women, Web3, and podcasting. Hi, I'm Christiana. Hi, I'm Georgie. And we'll be coming up later. I'll do that again. (laughs) Christiana and Georgie also coming up later to talk about Flight Studio. This podcast is sponsored by Buzzsprout, podcast hosting made easy with easy and powerful tools, free learning materials, remarkable customer support, and a new iOS app. From your daily newsletter, the Pod News Weekly Review. A year ago, we realized we'd inadvertently created a podcast growth platform that could redefine the industry and give new talent their own platform for their voice to be heard around the world. So today, I'm excited to announce the launch of our industry-first podcast growth platform, Flight Studio. What a big movie start to this story. Uh, What's going on here, Sam? Well, I think that was Stephen Bartlett from Diary of His CEO. Looks like they've launched a podcast media and technology company called Flight Studio, James. Um, God, then give me the rest of it. What is Flight Studio? Yeah, well, it's quite a thing. Uh, Stephen Bartlett, of course, runs um, Diary of a CEO, which is uh, the number two show in the UK, according to Edison Podcast Metrics. Uh, He's also one of the investors in the UK version of Shark Tank, which is called Dragon's Den in the UK. Um, A very, very big name. And he has um, jumped into a brand new company alongside two people from Acast, Christiana Brenton and Georgie Holt, to produce something which will make a number of, it says here, new video podcasts, which will be translated into multiple languages. I think they're using Wondercraft AI, as we might have mentioned earlier. And um, yeah, I think it's a really big deal. Well, yeah, let's go and ask Georgie Holt. I thought I'd go and ask her. Tell me more. What is Flight Studio, Georgie? It is a podcast growth platform and a media and technology company where our ambition is to scale and grow the most valuable podcast media brands in the world. And the way we look at value is not just by size and worth of these shows, but it's actually the impact and societal contribution that we believe that they can have to create a happier, whole, healthy human experience. And we have just launched. In fact, we only launched yesterday. We told the world what we were doing and we announced some of the people that we're doing it with. And Christiana and I are back on another co-founding journey together. But this time around, we have a founder and chairman in Stephen Bartlett. Okay, CB, how did that one come around? Was it a drinks (laughs) party? Was it a night in for the two of you? I know, let's email Stephen. I mean, how did that come about? (laughs) It's actually such a nice story. Georgie and I just responded to a LinkedIn post. So in October last year, Stephen posted on LinkedIn that um, he had ambitions to launch a podcast network and ultimately that he was really haunted by the potential of what he could do for other creators that he believed had important messages that could change the world. And that's ultimately in the blueprint that their team have created that enabled the growth of Diver CEO to be now the second biggest podcasting YouTube channel in the world in three years, which is absolutely unprecedented for the industry. So he had a brief LinkedIn post, which was really an open call for anyone to contact him that felt they could add value to the podcast media industry. And... I think it was about 1am that Georgie and I saw it and we just WhatsApped one another, not giving it too much energy. And we pulled together an email that I guess summarised a little bit about us and who we were, what we believed in, I suppose our credibility in the industry. But at that time, it was really pitching to Stephen if he would be interested in partnering with us on our previous venture. And then you can imagine our surprise when a couple of days later, because we include a hyperlink to schedule a meeting yourself, and a couple of days later, I was in a co-working space with Georgie and I must say I screamed <laughs> <laughs> because in my diary fell an invite of Stephen Bartlett stroke Christiana Brenton 
And I ran into a phone booth that Georgie was in and said, oh, my God, I think Stephen's replied. And then that same day, so again, no preparation, we had a call and we didn't quite believe it would be Stephen on the other side. We now know that there were over 25,000 people that emailed him. So when you think Gosh. about when you think about the chance and the luck there, we were kind of wondering if it would really be Stephen on the other side <laughs> of that call. And there he was. So, Can you give me the lottery numbers for tonight as well, please? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he tells us now it was something to do with how well the email was formatted. So there you go, everyone. Yeah. And, and succinct. So all those people who say LinkedIn's a waste of time, now they know, right? You know, there's so many stories yes, here yeah. in this company that people have found their way to working here because they proactively message him on LinkedIn in an interesting way or they've emailed him directly. I know he talks sometimes and says to folks, like, send the email, do the thing. It's like, I think we're a testament to that. And we want to make sure that we tell everyone yes. that too. It's like, send us the email, yes. message us. Make like, the move. Make the move. Make do the it. bold bet. Yeah. Because yeah. you just never know. Exactly. There you go. Okay. You haven't even got your feet under the table, let's be honest, but you've probably got some plans in mind. You've sh probably shared those plans with Steve. Where do we start? I mean, you've got five stellar A-list stars to start off with. Is that where we start or have you got other plans as well to grow that quite quickly? That's a great question. And I, I think it's going to be shaped and determined a little bit about how people respond to what we're doing. We were really intentional in those first five people that we signed. We really understood their impact because they had been on guests on Stephen's show. So mm -hmm. we could really understand the data insights that we were getting from YouTube and other metrics that Stephen can see around how that guest had an impact on the audience that he reached versus the other hundreds of shows that he has done. I mean, every guest has an impact and has a powerful message, but these shows particularly because they'd had such a visible impact on the metrics and also were very clearly experts in a vertical that they had a huge amount of credibility and background in. We really felt that these verticals that they represented contributed to a happier, whole, healthier human experience, whether that was love and relationships, whether that was human optimization, female health and wellness, neuroscience. We felt that these were the people that could take these topics to a place that gave a global impact and resonated with audiences and in a way that could really help and shape people's lives for the better. So we really felt that those were our five but that's nowhere near the end. We definitely have ambitions to, to keep finding those voices. They may already be podcasting. They may be new to the genre and the format, but have really scaled an audience in other places. So it's it's the start, by no means the end. But I think it, as with all of these things, you make something in sort of a lab-like environment behind the scenes. We've been crafting it for the last few months. You kind of give it away to the world. You ship the product to the customer, which is what we did yesterday. And I think people will start to tell us what they think it is too and what the potential is. And we're already starting to see that in the feedback. So I think right now we're very clear about being a, post, a podcast growth platform, that we are a media and technology company, that we want to create these multiplayer podcast brands, these video first podcast brands that have permission to play in all sorts of different interesting places, as Stephen has done with the diary of a CEO. And that will start to take shape as we move forward in the months ahead. So CB... Why video first? Everyone is going, oh, no, I've got a face for radio. I don't want to be on a video. <laughs> but you very clearly in your press releases have gone video first. Now, I know Stephen's video first, but he's got a face for video. I mean, why would you want to go down that road? Because that's a, a longer editorial studio setup. It's much more difficult to do. Why? Well, first I'll pass on your comment to Stephen, who like that. And then secondly, I mean, ultimately, we're following the audience consumption data and trends. It's so clear that um, it's scaling to the majority. So I believe now at 30% of all podcast consumption is via YouTube. And ultimately, that is our strategic advantage when you think about what Diary of a CEO has done. The reason Stephen and the team has been able to scale their podcast so fast is because it's video first. That really allows us to have a much wider promotional and distribution ecosystem than an audio first asset. If you think about where Diary of a CEO lives, yes, it's YouTube. Yes, it's podcast RSS. But ultimately, what this team is absolutely phenomenal at is growth hacking across social media channels. And you're able to then do that with a very rich video asset that we turn into trailers, which you would have seen. Anthony, who heads up the trailer teams of Flat Studio, he's an absolute genius. So by being video first, you have so much more rich visual promotional assets. And then when 
you consider how we can then extend our distribution ecosystem. And a great example of that is the fact that Dara CEO, we've just signed a partnership for both DOAC and Flight Studio to, for our shows to be available on Samsung TV. So we're going to be inbuilt in the entertainment hubs. We already have a partnership with Spotify TV. We're currently on 12 airlines globally, all video first as opposed to audio. About to have a partnership with Techno Gym, again, visual video first. So it really enables us to grow our distribution ecosystem and therefore capture more and more new audiences. And it's absolutely instrumental to the blueprint of Dire of a CEO. And that's ultimately what we're looking to leverage and extrapolate for new shows. So it's one of our first principles, if you will, that we won't compromise on because we know it works and we have the ultimate blueprint in the success of Dire of a CEO. Cool. I mean, Dire of a CEO is a great one to set out as your bar. So what does success look like, Georgie? We've seen companies like The Rest is Politics and we've seen Persephonica with Global, with the news agent. I mean, part of that is throwing a great deal of money behind it for advertising to get its rocket boost fuel behind them to get the audience. But what would you measure for you guys as success? It's a good question. I think when we look, it's almost time frames and time scales. I think if we look at it through that lens, what Steve and his team have done in the last three years is absolutely exceptional. And what we want to try and do is take that blueprint, those methodologies and fast track that for people because we've had that data experience, mm-hmm. that history, that knowledge, that expertise. We can now productize that and then create a growth platform that really can fast track these shows to this at the success and scale that Stephen has had across the last three years and really unlock that potential for these new voices that we can have this really true belief that they can go and change the world and to keep going on Christiana's point I think what the video first asset allows us to do I kind of think about podcasting as sometimes a snack and a full meal that sometimes you're in the zone for like a full meal you want the hour and a half you want the long form you've committed and created a good amount of time to give to an amazing podcast and that can be an audio and video but sometimes you just want a snack you just want to connect with your favorite show on a social media channel you're scrolling through tiktok you're on instagram and you get about 30 seconds of something from that show and it's compelling it's interesting it reminds you to go and maybe listen to or watch it later it's something you can share with a friend or a family member or a contact say hey this was interesting comment underneath and it might just be enough for that moment in time but it's still a huge amount of intention engagement with that show and I think the video first assets allow us to to think about how people are behaving on certain platforms there's the classic publishing sentiment that hasn't changed in 25 years since I've worked in publishing which is you have to create great content first and foremost and you need to go where people are and that's what we're intending to do is to go exactly where people are create the content they want for those particular platforms and then really drive the omnichannel maximization that we can through Flight Studio. It's really interesting it has a duality of a competitive advantage it helps us grow our audiences But equally, it helps us give us a really unique USP with brand partnerships Mm. in terms of being a video and audio product for brands. I'm sure you know the long form nature of podcast consumption and how attentive the ads are and the receptivity when you're also pairing that with visual aid. We've just seen absolutely phenomenal results from all of the partnerships with Dyer CEO, really long term partners. The average deal size is over a year and that's ultimately because we're proving out the performance of that audio visual. So that's really interesting as well because it fills our competitive commercial advantage, which then, of course, aids in all of the tech and innovation that we can then reinvest back into the business. So if you were looking out on the podcast network landscape, who's the gold standard for you to aspire to? Personally or professionally? Pick your hat. Oh, gosh. I think there's still so much green space. I think we haven't seen the potential of this industry fully unlocked. And I think you need people who are willing to disrupt and redefine something in order for us all to see the maximum potential benefit of this. We did discuss and debate in the early days whether we called this a podcast company transparently because we felt, and it's happened a couple of times, people like, oh, you're you're more than a podcast. This doesn't just feel like a podcast. But we're really committed to this belief that podcast is now a genre and it's a feeling and it's well understood exchange between a creator and an audience and that doesn't have to show up in the same way every single time it can show up in lots of different ways the same way we were talking about uh, when we look at the analytics on Stephen's show when we look at his YouTube audience 25% of people are watching the YouTube channel on TV but you'd still call that watching YouTube when I watch a BBC TV show on my phone I say I'm watching TV 
even though I'm watching something on my phone. So it's the way that we categorize these genres and the distribution channels that they tend to then lean into to get their content out. And right now our genre is a podcast and we're very happy and proud to call it that. And I think it's looking at this industry and say, are we ready for disruption? Are we ready to be redefined and to keep pushing for that experimentation, that innovation? Because I believe that if we all commit to that, then this industry is going to like keep growing. And there's so much green space for us all to grow into. Well, from our perspective, it was the diary of a CEO. That's why we're here. That's a podcast. I was thinking of a pod network. I mean, in my head, maybe being rude, but I'm thinking wandering. They're very, very different to the yeah. Flat Studio proposition because we are, yes, building media brands that are anchored in podcast content, but we understand, I would say really uniquely, the fact that they are media ecosystems and that's what audiences want. So rather than kind of categorizing ourselves in a podcast or one lane, what we're really interested in is building media brands. Yes, mm-hmm. there's podcasts, but equally Dara the CEO, for example, is a standalone brand now for his book, IP expansion, live events, mm-hmm. speaking engagements, product collaborations that don't actually rely on the mm-hmm. individual name of the creator. And so it's really difficult to even yeah. look at an example. I think Wondery have done an amazing job in transferring the IP from one mm. channel to another. I think that they are absolutely yes, gold yes. standard in doing Thank that. You. We yep. were talking before we came on about We Crack. I think that was a Wondery show. I think maybe mm-hmm. We Crack Wondery podcast then became an Apple TV show. The same with Dirty John. They've got a real rich history of really understanding yeah, the creative potential, potential in podcasting to test a new idea Mm. and to take that idea into another channel. So I think in terms of gold standard, they've certainly set it. And you're right. I think you're really right to call them out. I guess the other question I have, the five people that you are starting off with are celebrity driven. And CB, you just mentioned about creating a brand rather than a product, Mm -hmm. which is what Stephen is now. He's a multi-channel brand. Will you stay in the lane of celebrity brand development or will you go into other genres? Wondery does thriller and we've seen things like Serial from New York Times. Are you going to stay with that one area, which is probably your hottest sweet spot given Stephen, or are you going to broaden out? It's interesting. We don't really use the word celebrity to define the creators. They're ultimately subject matter experts, Mm -hmm. which is really interesting if you think about the content trends and certainly within Diary of a CEO, the highest performing guests of all time are not celebrity based on the Diary of a CEO. They're all researchers, scientists, experts, which I think really says something about the evolving nature of audience consumption and why they're choosing to consume podcasts and what for. What's the value exchange? And we find in the data that it's not necessarily for traditional entertainment, but rather to learn something, to be informed, to educate themselves and ultimately to inspire change that they can implement in their lives. Mm. So kind of any individual or person that is up to our overall mission of having a worthwhile story to tell that is underpinned by helping people in some way are the type of individuals that we're interested in exploring and expanding with. And right now they're very much, I'd say, geared to health in some way, subject matter experts, Paul C. Brunson dating and relationships, but obviously our personal romantic relationships to find mm. a huge part of our holistic happiness. But that's not to say that wouldn't evolve into, for example, the way that sport plays a really impactful mm. role in people's lives and the community that sport builds. So it's not necessarily one dimensional that they have to be health experts, if you will, but ultimately mm. that value exchange for the audience is one that makes them feel positive positive and that they're armed with more tools to live a better life. So in your press release, you talked about being multi-country. How and when will that start to kick in? I mean, as I said earlier, you're literally getting your feet under the desk in here in the UK and London. When do you want or see the expansion? Or have you already started? I don't know. It started. So there's a few things that we're doing. One is building out the studios in the US to begin with. That's the first stop on the, in the expansion journey. We want a US strategy from day one. We're already engaging a really smart and exceptional team out there in the US, which we're excited to start to put in place. And then really the next barriers are language and how translation tools can remove that. So I know it's not new news. There's a lot of people who are doing interesting things in translation and calling out people like Wondercraft, particularly for doing an exceptional job there. But we we're really focused on like, how do we remove the barriers to global expansion? And some of that looks like going and setting up the company in other territories. And sometimes that looks like how can technology help us Mm. do that? So we are committed to ensuring that language is not the barrier. And whilst it is 
a great way to remove it. It's not the only way to remove it. We know that we have to go and find the talent on the ground, the, the creators, the voices that live and breathe in that country and that culture. But it's a great starting point to understand where the impact is best found. And we're really passionate when we read uh, data like LATAM being the biggest podcast ad market and podcast audience base by 2027 in the next two to three years. So we're really excited and energized by what that potential looks like and who then is the best people for Flight Studio to engage to go and do this in partnership with. We know where we personally, CB and I can have the biggest impact, but who do we know? Who who are the people that are going to move this forward for us in those regions? But absolutely, global expansion turns up in many ways and it might be people on the ground or it might be a way that technology can help us. And Kristen Holmes, one of our first signings. So she's a US voice based out of Boston, um, the chief performance scientist at Whoop. And then you'll start to see us having more and more US voices within the flight studio roster. You mentioned Wondercraft, wonderful company, Oscar Saranda, we interviewed him recently. And I remember Steve talking on his own podcast about his, I think his girlfriend, maybe his wife now is Spanish, I believe. And his in-laws couldn't understand what Stephen did until Wondercraft put Diary for CEO in Spanish and then yeah. they heard him. That was the first time they could understand what he was doing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, she's French and French and girlfriend. But yes, exactly that story. I think he met yeah. Daniel Eck and very briefly and said thank you to Daniel for helping the relationship with the in-laws. <laughs> 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 because I think him and Daniel were really early collaborators on that product. So right. I think that Daniel and uh, Stephen have worked together in more ways than just one outside of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, revenue, generation, monetization. I mean, we've talked about the type of content. We've talked about the footprint of Flight Studio. Let's talk about the monetization. How are you going to monetize this content? Well, that's what's so unique about the commercial proposition that we've built within Flight Studio. So it's through all of the traditional formats you'd imagine within podcasting insofar as host reads ads, but really we are offering monetization opportunities across video, social, audio, branded content, live events, live experiences, speaking engagements, and then potential product collaborations. And it's just, there's such demand in market. And I think that's testament to the growth of Dyer SEO. We can't share specifics, but this year alone, we're on track to increase revenues by 300% from last year's base with Dyer SEO. And those partnership structures look multi-platform. They're longer term. They're leveraging Dyer SEO across Stephen's entire ecosystem. And we're ultimately looking to emulate those structures because it's in the benefit to our brands, delivering more effective partnerships, but equally creators, giving them many more opportunities for monetization outside of traditional just audio, host reads and ads. Cool. Now, Georgie, where does anyone go to find more information about Flight Studio then? Thank you, Sam. If they go to flightstudio.com, which is our website, they can also visit us on LinkedIn. They can find us on Flight Studio. You can find Christiana and I on LinkedIn as well. Like we said at the very top of this incredibly amazing opportunity came about because we sent an email Mm. and we sent a message so again for anyone who is listening they send us a message like we understand the power and impact of that so you can find us on linkedin and that's probably the fastest route to get to us cb i hope you've kept that linkedin message and it's framed somewhere now in your office (laughs) when you get an office every time you look at it you go yep it worked oh no (laughs) stay humble (laughs) so yeah we do have the email which i think is quite special Ladies, thank you so much. Congratulations and good luck for everything with Flight Studio. We'll keep watching. Thank Thank you, Sam. You're the best. Thanks. Moving on. Acast is now number one globally as a publisher. How's that come about? Yes, Acast. Have to do that every time you mention Acast, it's the law. (laughs) (laughs) Um, They're the number one publisher globally. So they have added themselves into the PodTrack ranker. Um, PodTrack now has two additional sales networks, one of them called the iHeartRadio Audience Network and one of them called Acast. It's the first time that they've been completely open about their numbers. 405 million downloads in March. Um, The number one publisher globally, the number three publisher in the US. Uh, Greg Glenday, who um, we uh, chatted to 
uh, while uh, we were at uh, Podcast Movement Evolutions in LA. He's very excited, obviously. He says that uh, we're seen not just as a global leader in these figures, but also as a top contender in the highly valuable US market. And I think, you know, it's probably fair to say that um, much of the US has seen Acast as being a foreign thing from Sweden, you know, not that big in the US and actually number three in the US. Uh, I think that these are tremendous numbers for them. Yeah, well, look, you know, I thought I'd reach out to Lizzie Pollitt. She's going to be on the show next week to tell us more about it. And actually, ACAST is approaching its 10th anniversary very shortly. And uh, Ross Adams is going to be with us here on the 24th of April to talk about how he's seen the last 10 years of growth with ACAST as well. Well, I look forward to hearing from both Lizzie and um, from uh, Ross uh, as well. Um AI. What's going on here then? Ah, oh, AI, AI. Should we be drinking when you say that first? It's a bit early in the morning for me, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, look, The Verge has said that companies like OpenAI are transcribing podcasts as data training for their artificial intelligence programs. A couple of weeks back, YouTube CEO Neil Mohan had warned AI that using videos from its platform to train forthcoming AI video generator, Sora would break its rules. Um, and, you know, it seems that AI companies are, you know, are they willy-nilly going to find data sources to keep feeding the beast or and, and doing it illegally, um, or are they just simply going to public data? Um, it's, a, it's a very dangerous area, and I don't know which way to look at it. It is. It's a, It's an incredible area. There was a story this morning in The Guardian talking about uh, Facebook that were genuinely talking about buying a book publisher, buying Simon & Schuster, I think that's their name, for um, essentially training AI. So they were going to buy the entire book company <laughs> just so that they had a ton of books that they could rather more legally um uh, you know, mine for open AI. I mean, the whole thing seems, you know, very uh, strange. Only a couple of weeks ago, of course, we had um, Apple and YouTube on the very same day saying that they want um, to be really clear and open whenever we use AI in, you know, in in apps and things, in in um, in podcasts and in uploaded videos and things. So I think people are beginning to understand that AI you know, it is going to be pretty well all pervasive. It's going to be in all of this kind of uh, thing. But also, I think that the lawmakers are catching up with them. Well, yeah, they are indeed. Uh, US Congressman Adam Schiff has introduced a bill to the US Congress that says major AI companies um, have to submit, basically, if they're using AI. Um, the California Democratic Congressman introduced the bill called the Generative AI Copyright Disclosure Act, which would require that AI companies submit any copyrighted works in their training data sets to the Register of Copyrights before releasing new generative AI systems. The bill would need companies to file such documents at least 30 days before for publicly debuting any AI tools yeah. or they would face financial penalties. That sounds pretty good or pretty draconian, I don't know. Again, I don't know which side I, of the fence I sit on yet. Yeah, so OpenAI would basically have to say every bit of data which is in their systems and indeed not just OpenAI but everybody else as well, um, uh, I guess. I mean, that would be... That would be quite a thing. Um, I know that there's an awful lot of talk in the radio industry as well about AI, and there's quite a lot of concern about AI taking people's jobs um, there. There's a brand new um, announcement that I hear, um, uh, which has just come out from a company called Super AI, which has a man called Zach Zalon, who sounds like a, a James Bond a great baddie. Name. Yeah, uh, exactly. Great name. Um, and uh, so what that system does is it uses AI to um, to do voice tracking, to, you know, have a, have a voice in there, uses AI to segue songs together so that it sounds pretty good, but it also uses AI to schedule all of the music as well. So theoretically, you can b basically put an entire radio station into you know, into a box and use that. Uh, it all sounds, all sounds fascinating. I suppose we should ask AI what, what, um, what AI thinks about AI. Uh, so let's do that. I think, like anything, it makes a difference what you are using the technology for. AI can be good as well as bad. It doesn't have to just be a bad thing. 
Well, you know, so there we are. AI has uh, spoken there. <laughs> Who is the other guy, James? Oh, that, that, that's Sam. Oh, yes, I've heard about him. He is the guy that does true fans. Yeah. Very good. Must go now. Yeah, bye. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so I think all of this, all of this ridiculousness. I, I find I find the whole thing fascinating. Uh, I, I I think that AI is really interesting, and I do wonder whether or not we will have to not just tell Apple and YouTube, but basically have to put something in our RSS feed somewhere saying that um, there's uh, AI, you know, there. I guess. Yeah. Well, I think we when Google was spidering the web. You know, which is not much different to what AI is doing. It's looking for data sets to actually train itself on while Google was just going off and finding everyone's websites. And we saw the benefit in that, so we didn't really stop them. But some people then went, mm, not sure I want you to Google my website. So we added a no follow into the HTML. I wonder whether we add a no AI into, uh, you know, data sets that we don't want um, open AI or other AI tools to go and index. Yeah, well, uh, the good news is that that already exists. Um, if you use robots.txt, uh, then OpenAI has actually um, published its uh, robot oh, okay. name, and you can yep. basically say, go away. So I've just checked the pod news um, robots.txt, and uh, yes, um, uh, it says in there, go away, AI crawler, and um, I'm not allowing the AI service to... Uh, you know, to have a look at my at my content, and I think that that's probably fair enough. But yeah, you know, absolutely. I think I, I think that um, you know that's opt out rather than opt in, and perhaps we should be in an opt in world here. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, talking about opt in, Todd Cochran uh, was talking about how he was approached by OpenAI to allow and be paid for them to um, index all of his YouTube videos. Really. There you go. Yes. There's a thing. So there is a way to be paid to get your stuff indexed by OpenAI. Well, nice. well that would be nice. Come come over here, now. OpenAI. Give us lots of your money. <laughs> oh, easily bought, aren't you? Easily <laughs> bought. <laughs> right. Now, um, who's been acquiring who, James? It looks like Sony's acquired podcast production company NeoHum. A, who's Neohum, and B, why are they acquiring Yeah, them? it's Neon, Neon Hum, and they have... Um, Neon Hum's been going for a number of years. It's um, a, a pretty good um, podcast production company, and clearly Sony have discovered that um, they need more podcast production work. I wonder whether or not it's a acquihire, because the CEO of Neon Hum, Jonathan, Jonathan Hirsch, is, uh, has been appointed as VP of Global Podcasts and head of of US creative for Sony Music's global podcast division. So I wonder if it's really an acquihire rather than um, acquiring a production company. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, certainly, it's certainly good to see Sony. I mean, they only closed one of their production companies down um, or one that they had a, um, uh, a joint venture with uh, only last year. So, um, you know, interesting seeing them opening one or, or requiring one again, but still, but there we go. Um, there's been uh, more uh, acquisitions as well. StreamYard, uh, the, re the remote recording tool, has been acquired by Bending Spoons. Do you know who Bending Spoons are? No, hang, hang on, wait, what? StreamYard's been acquired again. StreamYard has been acquired, yes. Oh, OK. Sorry, I'm just in shock because they were acquired by Hopin a little while back, a few years back. Correct. And so Hopin themselves has now been acquired by um, by Bending Spoons. Mm. I'd never heard of Bending no. Spoons, but I have heard of some of their brands. They own, uh, among other things, Meetup mm -hmm. and Evernote. Oh, wow. Um, so is Yuri Geller, you the Geller their CEO? <laughs> you remember the big changes to Evernote where all, mm. all of a sudden you, you couldn't have as many notes in there as you wanted to because the VC people had, had got involved? Well, it looks as if the VC people are now getting involved in buying uh, StreamYard. Um, um, so, uh, yes, so that's uh, happened. And uh, the Roost Podcast Network, some very good news. They have been acquired. Um, AJ Feliciano, who is the boss of uh, the Roost, does a very good job. And they have been acquired by a company called Knight. Now, I, I had never heard of Knight. But it turns out they're a talent agency. They focus on YouTubers and Twitch streamers. And they are the talent agency of Mr. Beast. 
Um, okay. And so, yeah, and so there's a definitely a thing going on there with uh, acquisitions there, um, and they're um, keeping a majority of the team, it says here. So not quite sure what that means, but nevertheless, um, good news for The Roost, which is a decent podcast network, so good to see them, you know, still uh, succeeding there. Mm. Now, uh, in advertising, the CPM model of advertising does not and will not ever work to sustain podcasting according to Mia Lobel, formerly head of content at Pushkin Industries. What was Mia saying? Well, she, um, I, I thought it was an interesting piece. She was writing for Current, which is a um, website for public uh, radio broadcasters mostly. Um, it calls itself public media, but it's public radio broadcasters mostly. And one of the things she, that she says right at the beginning is, back when I was working at, as head of content for Pushkin Industries, I never made it my business to truly understand how the cost per thousand model works. I had my hands full with all the shows and the people I was managing. So I left that work to them. And, I, and I'm kind of there thinking, surely if you're making stuff, you should at least understand how it's paid for. Seems a bit of a strange thing to admit that you couldn't that you couldn't and didn't um, find out how the system was actually working. Anyway, she then goes g- goes into a lot more a lot more detail about why she thinks that um, the uh, the whole uh, system is is broken and simply won't work and everything else. There's a new company called Media Disco out of New York who are trying to use collective bargaining power to enable um, advertisers to get lower CPMs. So I reached out to a guy who's the founder called James Allen, a lovely British guy who's now moved out to New York, and I asked him, tell me more about Media Disco and why it's trying to help the mid-sized advertiser get better reach and buying power. Media Disco is a platform that allows mid-market advertisers to get the same media buying power as the world's biggest advertisers. And there's a lot to unpack there, but that's the original starting point of the platform. Okay, so before we get into what Media Disco does and how it works, when did you identify the problem? Yeah, both myself and my co-founder, Joey, we come from an agency background. We worked at Dentsu for for a number of years each and worked with, in those roles, some of the world's biggest advertisers. So we saw firsthand in our day-to-day jobs what it meant for big hold codes to bring that power to big advertisers and get to market in a way where you know they have great access to the best ad tech, they have access to the best rates, they have teams that can go through the assessment process for them to help identify the best tech and tools out there. So we thought to ourselves, how do we bring that out to more advertisers? And the more we looked into it, we found that you know, despite the size of everything we just talked about, the big advertisers and the hold codes, it only represents about 22% of U.S. media spend each year. So the lion's share of media spend was actually out in the mid-market or smaller advertisers. But the way that they go to market is far more fragmented. It's either brands managing their own media or going through smaller independent agencies. And collectively, they all face a similar problem that when they go to market, that fragmentation means that they don't have the same ability to negotiate. They don't have the same access to ad tech. There are times when they get locked out of contracts by minimum spend thresholds and just generally don't have the same level of resources around them to help them make those decisions to get access to all of the best things that our industry has to offer. So we built Media Disco to be the self-serve access point to be able to get the best of the industry and also be able to access rates similar to the biggest advertisers that are out there. So with collective bargaining, James, are they finding that they're getting lower CPM rates? We work directly with a select group of sellers on our platform to negotiate unique media disco rates. So they do get access to rates that they wouldn't be able to get if they weren't working directly through us. Yeah. Okay, so now explain to me, I'm an advertiser, I've come to you. Is this self-service? Is this white glove being held by an account manager or somewhere in between? It's a bit of both. It can be a choose your own adventure. So we built the platform deliberately to be a self-serve tool. It should be the place that you can go to. Everything feels very straightforward. We've 
taken our knowledge of the media industry and the way that you would go about getting a campaign live and tried to distill that down into a process that feels very focused as you're going through that process. So you can get in and you can find exactly what you're looking for based on the brief that you have. You can search based on objectives, based on audiences, budgets, or the channels that you're trying to activate in, or all of those things. From there, you can find the things and campaigns that our sellers have put together and get them live really easily. Or you can go through, essentially submit an RFP through the platform. So you can put a request in and say, this is exactly what it is I'm looking for, which then goes out to our sellers and they can populate we call them media packages, into the platform that you can then really easily transact on from there. So you talked about partners. Who are some of the partners that you're working with? <clears throat> yeah, we have a wide range of partners. We've built it deliberately so that we've covered almost every channel as we look at all the things that the advertisers could activate campaigns with. So we have a range of partners from, you know, the audio-specific partners. We've got Audio Mob which are in-game audio, ACAST have a storefront on there, all the way through to some kind of more of the non-traditional media types. So we have some in-game in -game display, we have some out-of-home, we have you know, rich media, we have CTV. So the idea is that advertisers can get in and they can put together multi-channel campaigns really easily and also discover multi-channel campaigns really easily. There are times when... You're trying to get a campaign live and you know what the objective is, but you don't necessarily know exactly what it is that you're looking for from a media activation point of view that can best meet your objectives. So by going objective first or audience first, it really does open the aperture of what you can activate and what you can find when you're campaign planning versus just going back to what you know or what you've done previously. How do you track success within these campaigns? So our partners report back to us the metrics on the back of each media package that's activated. And it really depends on what was the KPI going into those packages. So it could be a CPM rate, it could be a click-through rate, it could be you know cost per completed view. Whatever it is that the advertiser has decided is their key metric as they're going through the process, they can customize that. So they can say, here's the thing that's most important to me. And then all of those metrics are reported back on the back end of the campaign. And actually, payment isn't taken on our side until the full reporting is delivered. So looking forward from where you are now, what comes next for Media Disco? Yeah, so the what's next is a big question. Inevitably, AI. Yeah, I think looking at AI as a tool to achieve a goal is the way that we're thinking about it rather than it being the end point itself. It's really about how do we take the vision that we're trying to work towards and improve that experience using AI rather than just building AI first. So that's kind of what we're thinking about. But ultimately, the immediate next step for us is continuing to try to achieve that vision of leveling the playing field. And part of that is making sure that we truly have the right range of options for advertisers to choose from when it comes to a media capability point of view. So as we start to assess and bring in more and more partners, what we'll do is grow the capability set that advertisers have access to, and also grow the depth of that capability set. So making sure that everything's covered off and then within each of those categories, making sure that they have the right range of options and customizability that comes with that so that it feels like a, an end-to-end -end planning tool. Where does brand safety sit within what you offer? Brand safety is obviously a part of any campaign that you'll be getting up and running. And we've built that into the quote, I'm doing air quotes right now, the checkout flow. Of, so as you're going through that process, any brand safety requirements that you have, you can put that in as specific instructions to go into the IO and kind of select your tolerance as you go through. So that that then is given over to our partners as a part of the IO instruction, and they can bake that into the campaigns. You talked about a qualifying bar. What is the qualifying bar for an advertiser then? Yeah, there's a few. We like to know how our media partners perform, whether that's having worked with them before or audited their material. And that'll be the way that we look at it going forward as well. But we also like to think about, you know, what's interesting to mid-market advertisers. What are some of the capabilities out there that are a little outside of what they're currently doing? 
they tend to fall a little bit more towards you know activating self service social or search, which are all great parts of a campaign. But we're not there to compete with those things. We're there to expand the remit of what their media campaigns can do. So we look for the things that can really add on to their campaigns rather than compete with what they're already doing. And where are you in the funding cycle? Are you fully funded now? Are you seeking funding, not bothered yet? You're revenue positive, you're profitable. Where do you sit within in that cycle of business? Yeah, we went through an accelerator last summer, which gave us a bit of funding and a bit of direction in terms of how we built the product, which was great. From there, we've been bootstrapping. We've kind of took that investment and we've made it work for us. I think as we get to to midsummer this year, then I might have a different answer for you. So I might have to come back and have (laughs) another chat about that. No worries. James, thank you so much. Look, where can people go to find more details about Media Disco? Yeah, please do head over to mediadisco.io. From there, you can set up your account. You can browse through our marketplace of pre-populated deals. You can kind of customize those deals to suit you, or you can submit an RFP and we'll help make sure that the deals that you're looking for are in the marketplace ready and waiting for you. So looking forward to it. Brilliant. James, thank you so much for that. Thank you, Sam. Really great to be here. From your daily newsletter, the Pod News Weekly Review. James Allen. Um, So uh, I am very much looking forward to uh, working for uh, Podcast Day Asia, which is going on in uh, Malaysia at the end of um, at the end of uh, August, beginning of September, talking to lots of people from Southeast Asia, including uh, India. And uh, Sam, I know that you ended up having a really good conversation at Podcast Movement Evolutions with someone from India as well. Yeah, I mean, Anu Badwaj, uh, she's the CEO of Sheconomy. Um, and we mess up at Podcast Movement in LA. Uh, lovely lady. And she knows everybody. It was really funny. We were walking around together. She, I think um, uh, she became my P, uh, Podcast Movement buddy. We just went around everywhere. Um, but everywhere I went, she seemed to know the people that I knew. So I said, I, I don't know why we've never met before. But Sheconomy is a really interesting new platform that she's been developing. It's f- aimed at the she economy, the female economy. It's a platform where she has uh, created podcasts for female entrepreneurs and female conversation. Um, It works across multiple devices. It started out on iOS, but it's going all the way down to do PodLP and KaiOS, and it's on the Asian TV uh, market as well. Um, And yes, it uses... uh, their own coin to actually, you know, aggregate um, activity and attention. Uh, And so you can acquire coin and then exchange that coin for goods and services. But, you know, I wanted to ask Anu herself directly to tell me more about what is Sheconomy, why she built it and what its future aim is. Sheconomy is the world's first and only podcast listening app that's now on Android, iOS, KaiOS and a new operating system called Geo, which you've probably already heard of with Geo7 um, and Pod LP. We've now entered into the low-cost mobile market, and we just announced that we entered into the televisions, Geo STBs in India, and on their $100 laptops, the Geo Books, already present on the Geo Next phones, the Android phones, which we created during COVID. So what type of content is on Sheconomy? What's in there? Yes, great question. So it's the world's first and only podcast listening app focused on women's content primarily. And this would be anything from women's health to entrepreneurship, investing, leadership, technology, uh, wellness, healing, different kinds of meta tags, including climate, women climate warriors, as well as topic-specific, language-specific. So let's say uh, content around Spanish. It's all Latina podcasters. We've got Bengali, Hindi, Telugu, Marathi, Arabic. So we went really specific, not just on the devices, multi-device. We went multilingual as well as multi-platform. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Is this India only or is this available globally? Sheconomy was actually built first on iOS, then we built on Android, and then we saw a surge of 
downloads, about 300,000 downloads in 195 countries. So we're now all over Africa. We're on island nations. We're in the far corners of Latin America, Asia. So at the moment, India is the newest market for us, the newest focus as of this past March. We announced it on March 8th with Geo, but until then we were global. Awesome. Now, how do people on your platform monetize? What's the form of monetization? So at the moment, we have listeners and we have creators. And the way it works is you can listen, learn, and earn. Anyone from anywhere can earn Sheik tokens. And these are reward tokens. And the way we built Shikonomy was that we wanted to incentivize people to engage from inception. And everyone had the same access and everyone had the same ability once they were able to listen. And it should be equal at the end of the day. We thought, you know, what, let's start building this on low cost devices, get this to work. And then with more listenership, because at the moment, um, let's be honest, the, the democratization of podcasting hasn't reached its full potential because we're leaving 30% of the world out of the equation. And so we wanted to start w- by addressing that digital divide, that audio gap, that educational gap. Um, let's start there and incentivize people to listen. The more that people listen, you've got consumer brands that are trying to engage this population because guess what? They're consumers too. So at the end of the day, the monetization will be podcasters who want to get a bigger audience, a greater audience, reach more people with their content. They get more downloads and ultimately they can start charging brands more for their ads whether it's host red ads or a dynamic ad insertion and, or whatnot, but we're flipping the model on its head. We're saying there can be another way to be both inclusive, to get more diversity of content, and spread the wealth with brands to the people, and let's try it and see you know where this goes. So at the moment, we're testing out a membership model. We just started... It's an annual membership of $500 for anyone that would like to come in or a lifetime membership of $1,000. We've had a community from before that's now building, but ultimately this is our community that supports amplifying the voices of women uh, that have been traditionally marginalized, underserved, or underrepresented. Okay, let me try and understand that because slight confusion in my head. So if I was female and I joined Sheikonomy, I can buy tokens and I can give those tokens to the content creators as rewards for listening to their content. Is that correct? There's no buying tokens. These are just rewards. And it's rewards like airline points or hotel points, which can be redeemable at a later stage. For the time being, since we've been building in stealth all through COVID, this was a kitchen table project, I would say our primary focus was let's get the devices built Let's get the integrations completed. Um, Going mobile is very difficult from the onset. We have a web directory as well. But the most important thing was getting the content. And the second part of the equation was making sure that we have enough languages that's representative that people can participate. So inclusivity was a big thing. So we said for those people that want to blast their content to the masses and not pay Mark Zuckerberg $1,000, uh, for running ads for a couple of weeks or a couple of geographies. We said, there's another option. There's another alternative. If you'd like to work with us, let's do that and get you out to as many ears in addition to as many eyeballs. Cool. Now, when did you start this? You said it was back in COVID. But before you did that, you were also working on another project, which was fundamentally a project to do with the state of women. You were producing a report and you're in the fifth anniversary report. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So the State of Women is a U.S. 501c3. It's a nonprofit. For the rest of the world, you'd understand this as an NGO. And what this nonprofit does is it's focused on amplifying the voices, marginalized, underserved, underrepresented women and girls using all forms digital. And we had been working with events and conferences and During the pandemic, we created an event series called Amplifying Her Voice. So we joined together podcasters. We joined together people, women that are in AI, 
women in blockchain, women focusing on leadership. And we had all kinds of content. And we had a Mother's Day event, a Father's Day event. We had a International Women's Day event. We partnered with the government of Bermuda for Women's Entrepreneurship Day. And we had sponsors come in like Deloitte and Butterfields Bank and Clarion Bank and Bacardi and all different kinds of companies that came in to amplify women's voices on different topics. And what we did is we had about 150 podcasters, mostly female, that formed the State of Women Podcast Network. And we also had a collaboration with the Podcast Academy, which you're probably familiar with, Rob Greenlee and Michelle Cobb. And so once a month, we'd have a State of Women networking reception, which was open to women, their members, as well as our members, and they would come together and have a virtual networking event. So really, that organization works hand in hand with Shikonomy, because once we build the apps, we have these low cost phones that we can then donate to foundations and charities and different women's groups and organizations. So that's why that organization's there. We also applied for a number of grants that we won the Islamic Development Bank, Algorand Foundation. We also worked with SDG Impact Accelerator and also Reliance Geo. So you've got the report, you've got the platform, you've got the sheet economy that you're focusing around to bring brands in. What's next? Where does this all lead to? Well, the ultimate goal is is using podcasting as a tool to mitigate the digital divide. And we can do this with audio. And many of you have already been doing this. I would say everyone listening or reading this article has already played your part because you're using a medium that's accessible to, I would say, the majority of people who can't read. And ultimately, if we can just get this out there even broader uh, to reach more people, then we've accomplished our mission. And so what we'd like to do going forward is partner with organizations like yourself, work with podcasters like yourselves to basically get outstanding content to people that want to listen, learn, and earn. And if we can do that and we can collaborate and move the needle forward to those people who really want to engage with your content that haven't had access before, then we're winning. And for those people who've already been accessing amazing content, if you'd like to share that with more people and get behind this, maybe offer scholarships to young women and girls who want to share their voice or share scholarships to people that want to learn the craft of podcasting, whether it's editing or making audiograms or social media or whatnot, then fantastic. We do this together. And we've got the platform now that's ready, that's built for brands to engage, for podcasters to engage, for industry leaders to engage. I think the way forward is together. And that's it. That's one answer. It's the way forward is together. And that's what we're doing. Cool. Now, where would anyone go to find out more information then? So please check out Shikonomy. It's on any platform. You just have to spell it right. It's S-H-E-Q-O-N-O-M-I website, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. We're building an active LinkedIn group. So please do check us out, S-H-E-Q, if you forgot one more time, O-N-O-M-I. Thank you. Amazing. Anu, thank you so much. Thank you for telling us all about Shikonomy. Again, if you need to find out more about it, go to the website. And obviously, if they wanted to contact you, are you on LinkedIn, Twitter? You're everywhere, aren't you? What What was your handle? What would they connect you with? I think the best thing right now is to go on LinkedIn and type in the name of the company, follow our page. I'm requesting you, if you want to have any contact with us, follow our page and send a message. You will get to me. The personal LinkedIn is full. The Facebook is full. Instagram, I'm not very active. My team manages it for me. I would say go on LinkedIn and type in S-H-E-Q-O-N-O-M-I and that's how you would reach me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. It was a pleasure. People News on the Pod News Weekly Review.
Right, time for some people news. And uh, hiding away in Australia, um, there's been a few appointments um, by the ABC. Tim Roxburgh is uh, EP of True Crime Podcast. Interesting to see the public service broadcaster here having an EP of True Crime Podcasts. There's even a development executive for True Crime, Rachel Brown. And Joel Werner has come back to uh, the ABC as well. There's also expansions in Audio Boom. There's a new chief financial officer for Spotify. That's exciting. He used to work for Saab. Um, Saab, you might know as a car manufacturer, but it's really um, a manufacturer of defence systems and things like like that. Um, he starts in uh, October. Um, and uh, there's an acting CFO until then, Ben Kung. Uh, probably worth pointing out that Christian is a, a Swedish person, or at least has lived in uh, Sweden for uh, some, some time. The previous chief financial officer was an American, Paul Vogel, who, of course, um, was kind of sacked, basically, at the end of last year. He actually leaves Spotify at the end of this month. Um, what else is going on? Millie Webber um, has been hired as a digital agent in the UK for talent agency WME. I find it interesting that there's a talent agency uh, very much getting involved in the UK now for um, being a uh, agent for creators and for podcasting as well. Uh, and Joe Bucci has been appointed as chair of Audio and Pro, which is a digital audio advertising platform that I know very little about, but I do know the people who run it and I'm looking forward to bumping into them at the podcast show in London. You can see more people news uh, and more jobs indeed at podnews.net slash jobs. Podcast events on the Pod News Weekly Review. Um, let's have a look at some uh, awards, uh, shall we, uh, Sam? The uh, Independent Podcast Awards, they're uh, open for entry, aren't they? Are we entering? Oh, are we entering? <laughs> There's a thing. Hmm, maybe not. No. Um, <laughs> we've until, and in fact, we, um, given that Pod News is a, uh, is a media partner, we're probably not allowed to. Um, but anyway, you've, you've until May the 31st to enter. And the ceremony will be held in October in London. Um, there are four new categories. Interestingly, entry fees have been frozen from last year. Um, so uh, there's a thing. Uh, there are also the nominees for the Webby Awards. Very exciting. And the winners of the India Audio Summit and Awards 2024 were announced. Um, that, I remember, is a radio uh, competition. It's now very much uh, a podcast competition uh, as well. Um, so that's uh, all good. And in terms of uh, events, I'm very much looking forward to the podcast show in London. Um, I'm doing four uh, 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 talks um, while I'm there. Are you? Um, wow. Yeah. I know you're doing the keynote. What else are you doing? So I'm doing the keynote. Um, we're doing uh, the Pod News Weekly Review um, ah, live yes. on stage right at mm -hmm. the end. Uh, I'm also doing some live demos of uh, tools for, for podcasters that people should be having a play with. Um, it may have the word AI in the title um, just because it gets more people to go to, the, to that particular session, <laughs> I, I gather. Um, so that'll be fun. Um, and I'm also uh, looking after a panel for uh, Australian podcasters. Uh, so Sharon Taylor will be there from Omni Studio. Um, Corrie Layton will be there from uh, ARN's iHeart Podcast Network Australia. Uh, and um, other uh, Aussies will be there too. Uh, looking forward to uh, doing that. I'm busy trying trying to work out what we can give the audience um, because we should give the audience, I don't know, Vegemite or Tim Tams or something. Oh, Tim Tams. Yes, please. Yeah. I'll be there. If you do Tim Tams, I'm coming. Otherwise, yeah. can't be bothered. Excellent. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. Um, and uh, there's Berlin Podcast Week, which has been announced for September the 10th to the 15th. Um, apparently a wealth of expert knowledge on topics such as AI reach and monetization, uh, which uh, all sounds exciting. Anyway, more events uh, like that, podnews.net slash events. The tech stuff, tech stuff on the Pod News Weekly Review. Yes, it's the stuff you'll find every Monday in the Pod News newsletter. Here's where Sam talks technology. What technology are you going to talk about this week, Sam? Well, um, I, as part of the... Uh, podcast standards project as you know that i'm part of now um, i'm really excited to say that steve mcclendon from youtube has joined us um 
you know, it, again, there's no commitment from YouTube yet as to supporting the podcast 2.0 tags or anything like that, but it's great that he's joined the conversation. So welcome, Steve, to the PSP. Yes, that's uh, very exciting. Um, and I notice also that Pocket Casts, who is in the podcast standards project, still written on the website is coming soon. But I notice that they are supporting WebSub. Now, I know that WebSub isn't a podcast standards project thing, but it's still um, very good that they're supporting it. It's basically a way for you to get new episodes of your podcast faster into um, into the app. And so using uh, WebSub is a great first uh, step. So um, really good to see Pocket Casts doing that. Yeah, I need to reach out to Ellie Rubenstein, who is the lead for Pocket Casts, and ask her why WebSub and not Podping? Because as part of the certification for 1.1, we're hoping to make um, Podping part of the uh, certification requirements. So again, I probably need to reach out to Ellie and say, hey, didn't you want to just jump straight to Podping? But we'll see. Well, yes, well, we'll see. I know that Dave doesn't like WebSub very much at all, but um, uh, I, I am, uh, as a, as a, I'm not, I'm not a consumer of either Podping or WebSub, but I'm a publisher to both. Um, and they're both super easy as a publisher, but I don't know what the difference is in terms of a, in terms of a consumer of it. Well, I love the original name of WebSub, which was PubSub Hubbub, which Indeed. somebody in Google came up with. Wow. Um, yes. No, I, I, I think, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder why Google's struggling with names. Um, but moving on from that, um, yeah, I think it's great that that's been done. Um, I'm just curious why they didn't go the full hog and go pod pin, but, you know, there's probably a good reason. There's probably some service or service somewhere inside of WordPress that needs to use WebSub still, but hey. Well, there you go. Who knows? And on the website, James, yes, it will be updated. Don't worry, I'm, I'm working on that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 24 hours in a day, James. Yes, That's all there is. 24 talk, hours talk in a day. Talk to me about it. Talk to me about it. <laughs> now, uh, there's a new tag. A way to list publisher feeds is under construction for the new podcast namespace. What's this one, James? Uh, yes, this is um, this allows podcast apps to basically go, um, uh, I am, you know, such and such podcast company. Here are all of the shows that I publish. Um, which you can kind of do on Apple Podcasts, but not really. You can have channels on Apple Podcasts, and some people um, use it for that, um, uh, for that, you know, in that way. Um, but um, it's not always used in that way. And actually, it's quite handy to have a full list of all of the um, podcasts that you're uh, that you actually make. And so the idea is to show, you know, be able to show other podcasts from this publisher. Um, and the idea also is to provide some sort of verification that it is owned by that particular person. Uh, it's an interesting idea, so uh, worth a peek, I think. Yeah, we've, um, with my true fans hat on, we've implemented it all, the publisher feeds. And I think it's interesting, um, publisher feeds, although that's a generic name, can have artist feeds as well within it. And it uses the medium tag as the way to differentiate between, say, Wondery listing all of their podcasts under a publisher feed and maybe mm. an artist music artist listing all of their feeds under their own uh, uh thread and and again these can be self-hosted as independent podcast feeds so rss feeds um and I, I, one of the companies that's pushed this really hard is rss blue david ass and i know oscar was involved from fountain at the very beginning of it um what's really interesting though is because we've done both of these is we can apply a follow model to both uh, publisher and artist feed. So let's say I want to follow Wondery and then Wondery mm. release a brand new podcast. Oh, yes, of course. That gets added to that feed, but we then alert anyone who's interested, who's following Wondery, that there is a brand new podcast. So it's not just yeah. to publish out, but actually an update as an ongoing process as well. Yeah, really interesting. Really interesting. Well, there's more details on that on the GitHub, uh, as well as uh, various other things as well, isn't there? Yeah, now there's also, I mean, we're, we're coming to the end of phase seven. So there's a bit of a, a bun fight going on on the GitHub as to what's going to get in and what's not. Um but there's the location tag, which I know, James, you originally proposed, and there's been a toing and a froing uh, about what the use of the location tag is. But I think you've come up with um, an 
update or an enhancement to the original proposal? What is it? Yeah, so I'm basically, um, so the location tag, um, some people um, thought could be used for where you're recording from. Um, and um, that doesn't necessarily, that wasn't the original intention. It was supposed to be the editorial subject of something. But um, actually, I think that it's very possible to make the podcast location tag for both. Um, you would need to make that a tag that you can have multiple times in order for that to work. But I think that that's perfectly uh, doable. And actually making a podcast location tag to appear multiple times is probably even good for this for this very show, because this show is recorded in two places. Um, so it's recorded in the UK in Buckinghamshire and it's recorded in Queensland in Australia. And so therefore actually having two recording locations kind of makes sense from that point of view. But I'm very keen to make sure that it isn't just a random piece of text, which you can't really do anything with, you know, so London, England, it's great, but what does that actually mean? Um, I'm also keen that it's not just a lat long uh, number, um, so you know, just pointing at a spot on a map, but we're actually using some form of a place ID um, because a, a, a place ID allows you to um, enable uh, searches that you otherwise couldn't really do. So I want all podcasts about railway stations. Uh, in the UK, for example. Shh, don't say train spotter. <laughs> don't say train spotter. That would be really easy um, in terms of the tech because you've got um, a list of all, um, you, you know, you've got a list of um, all places in the UK um, with, uh, for example, OpenStreetMap, but um, Google has something and various other things have them as well, where you can say, okay, just show me the railway stations. Just, I, I don't know, maybe I'm in a wheelchair, so I want the accessible railway stations. So just show me accessible railway stations. Um, what podcasts are there about these? Um, or what podcasts are there about tourist destinations in North Wales? Or what podcasts are there about, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You can do all of that kind of information if you, you don't just use a latlon um, or you don't just use a piece of text, which is the worst thing that you can possibly do. Um, so what, what I'm what I'm quite keen to do is firstly expand the location tag so that it would work with a, um, uh, a place of recording as well as a um, as well as an editorial subject. So you can say where you've recorded a podcast as well as what that podcast is about. Um, and I think uh, the other thing that I would like to do with it is to basically say, we have to have some form of place ID. I would like an OpenStreetMap ID, um, but there may well be other developers that are more comfortable with a, a Google Places ID or um, various other things or a Wikidata ID or, or all of that kind of uh, stuff. But some form of Places ID that would then allow us to do really cool stuff in forthcoming apps. That's what I would really like to happen. Mm, I, I like to see it. I've, I read the proposal. I really like what you were doing because uh, you gave a good example somewhere in Marlow in Buckinghamshire, somewhere I might know about, um, yeah. talking about one of the islands as being a, a central point if you did long lat, um, but you added the wiki data. So I think, yeah, I can see this being a really useful extension or enhancement to the original location proposal. Um, yeah. The original location pr proposal had that in, but it had it in as an optional right. thing okay. of not not having to have a an OpenStreetMap ID. And obviously, if you have to have an OpenStreetMap ID, it is a bit more complicated for a podcast host or for somebody to do that initial coding, but you only have to do it once. Mm. But once you've got that data in, my goodness, you can do some amazing things with it. Um, and I think that that's the thing, you know, I, I, I'm always come at this from a point of view of what does the what can we do with this data if it's just a piece of text that says you know recording in my front room um then that's not very useful whereas if it's a piece of text that you can then push into um a search where you're looking for all podcasts recorded in buckinghamshire well great 
let's grab that let's grab that information and, and let's use that and let's see what we can build with that kind of information rather than just another another field that will probably end up f- being filled in wrong <laughs> you know what yes. i mean well and we found quite a few when we've been ingesting them so yes i i, I look forward to mm. it now um phase seven as i said will close very shortly i think it's the end of may that it's it's going to be up to or maybe somewhere in june um other items that are being considered, single item, which is for uh, music, podcast host, which is a really interesting new one that was recently proposed because the generator field is always sometimes, you know, WordPress sometimes use it. Um, and if you want to know who the host of it is, so it could be a very quick one to implement uh, because it doesn't require user input. Um, there's one for content. Link. There's so many that are going. And, and the thing I'd say is there's about probably eight or ten tags that are being proposed for phase seven. Mm-hmm. Let's um, Move on. Uh, shift on. There's a free lookup tool to find podcast GUIDs from RSS feeds from Andrew Grummet. It's very good. Uh, I'm sure it will be a very useful um, tool. Um, and so that is uh, freely available. Um, you'll find that in the Pod News newsletter this week. Uh, Apple Podcasts has added transcripts to its Mac OS app, which is um, very handy, uh, particularly if you want to uh, find out what somebody has said um, about your co host uh, in a. Um, uh, in a podcast, um, so that's uh, so that's always always uh, <laughs> handy to do. Uh, I've just been having a quick read of um, yes, gosh, you must have you must have annoyed somebody. Uh, so <laughs> what again? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what else is going on? Um, Headliner celebrated its sixth birthday. Um, it has already produced 138 years of content. And at least uh, at least one year of that is this show uh, for We Use Headliner to get us up onto uh, YouTube. So um, so that's a good thing. Uh, Headliner has been existing for a long, long time. So many congratulations uh, to uh, them. And what else is going on, uh, Sam? Well, um, Arvid Carl, um, who does this new platform called Podscan. Um, he's received a six-figure amount of investment. I don't know too much about Podscan. It's basically uh, going through and harvesting lots and lots of data from podcasting and then allowing you to do sort of like a, a Google Alerts mention. Mm. So if you want to find out if your company brand or your name's been mentioned, I probably should have one of those, shouldn't I? Um, in, in anyone else's podcast, then uh, it would alert you. Um, he posted on uh, X that he has 200,000 background jobs per hour running, checking podcasts for new episodes, transcribing ones I found, checking chart rankings, sending webhooks, adding new podcasts to scan emails. Look, I, I don't know whether this is a good or a bad tool. And, and if this is, we talked about AI scraping stuff. I don't know if this is a good thing as well, but um I might have to reach out to Arvid and see if he'll come on and yeah. tell us more about PodScan. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it certainly looks uh, really interesting. If he's transcribing um, podcasts, I mean, he says he's checking podcasts for new episodes. Um, he could probably be one person that might um, find Podping quite useful, you'd have thought. Um, but if he's transcribing 200,000 uh, shows every hour, then he's, he's doing pretty well there. So, um, yes, it would be interesting to find out more about what um, PodScan is is uh, doing there, yeah. Now, Castro, um, it's it's basically having a second coming of the Lord. Uh, what's it doing, James? Well, it's, um, it, it, it's just released an update to the app, which you'll find in the uh, Apple App Store. Um, lots of bug fixes, lots of new things going on. Um, they've added an interactive widget. They've added all kinds of other things as well. Um, so really good to see Castro, which, um, you know, really sort of founded for quite some time after it was bought by a, a, a venture capital company. Really good to see them, um, to see that app at least beginning to um, uh, move again. So, um, yeah, really good to uh, see that. Yeah, new ownership. So congratulations to Castro. Um, James, you've been busy. You've been working on something called OPML. I thought OPML was dead. <laughs> well, it's not dead because it is the number one reason or the number one way to get your podcast out of Google Podcasts, which is closed in one country in the world, but um, uh, is still open in 
all of the rest of them. Um, uh, so OPML is a very um, uh, useful way of um, pulling a ton of uh, different podcasts into your app. And I suddenly thought, well, hang on a minute. I've got a, a, a podcast page full of the Ambies winners, for example. I've got a podcast page full of the top 25 shows in the UK, for example. Why can't I just create an OPML feed for those pages? So if you want um, to instantly pull all of the top 25 shows for the UK into your podcast player, uh, then you can because there's an OPML uh, link now available at the bottom with the OPML logo and everything else. Um, and so it's sitting there waiting uh, for you now. Any page on the Pod News website which has a big list of shows, um, so quite a lot of award winners, quite a lot of um, top charts and things like that, you can now import all of those shows directly into your podcast player it'll be interesting to see if anybody uses them mm, yeah, we will i mean I, I i'm not i was being slightly facetious about opml being dead it's not dead obviously but um I, one of the things i i looked at was the way that the podcasting to the o community is using remote items things like publisher feeds for example things like uh pod rolls so we're beginning to list uh uh, podcasts in a different way to OPML and you can import and export publisher feeds, you can import and export pod rolls. Mm. So I'm just wondering whether OPML is a standard that, you know, will fade or is it going to supersede or be superseded by the way that the podcasting to the O community is using remote items? Well, I mean, you know, I'm sure that there'll be lots of things that will be superseded by podcasting 2.0 at some point, but we're probably talking about 10, 15, 20 years in the future, rather sadly, for some of these things. So I think that OPML still has um, a good way to go. I mean, it's supported by all kinds of um, apps, um, supported by Overcast, Antenna Pod, Pocket Casts, Podbean, Castro, Good Pods. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a pretty well-supported thing. Um, it's not um, the world's most exciting spec, but it's quite a useful thing. So to be able to, you know, just basically having a really simple way of pulling in a ton of shows into a particular podcast app is, you know, is a thing there. And I think that'll be a thing for, you know, many years to come. Boostergram. Boostergram corner. 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 On the Pod News Weekly Review. Yes, it's our favourite time of the week. If you are a, um, if you get value out of what we do, um, then we're always looking for your value back, and you can uh, value us in terms of um, time, talent, or treasure. Tell other people about Pod News or the Pod News Weekly Review, or indeed send us um, some money. Send us a boost if you have a boost button in your podcast app. Uh, if you don't, uh, podcasting two dot org is where you'll find a decent podcast app, um, or of course uh, you can. Uh, uh, go to weekly.podnews.net and find out much more uh, information. We've got a couple of boosts this week, haven't we? Mm, we have. Adam Curry, uh, the podfather, said market cap equals shares outstanding times share price. Pretty meaningless as to how the company is performing. Also, some companies may only have 20% ownership I'm in the public market skewing things even further. Yeah, look, I, I fully agree, Adam. It is only shares available, shares outstanding at time share price, but it's it's the nearest you get to like v. like. That's the one I could say. When we're looking at companies' performances, um, share price is a future evaluation of the risk that they're providing to the market or lowering the risk, and it goes up or down based on that risk assessment by uh, – brokers and, and people in the markets and the number of shares that are out there. Now, of course, companies buy back shares, which again, I think that Biden administration was going to stop companies doing. So at the end of the day, yeah, it, it's it, it's as useful as a wet rag in the dry desert, right? It, it's, not, it's not a major metric that you can put your hat to, but um, it, it's one that you use. It's about as useful as downloads. So there you go. 10,000 sats from Adam Curry. There you go. He was using a podcast guru for that and also sent another 10,000 sats to the Pod News Daily saying, supporting Pod News with value because it's valuable to me. This is how it works. Uh, so thank you, uh, Adam, for that. And also thank you to Matt Cundall, 2,112 sats uh, using Fountain. And he says that um, the uh, interview from Hub Hopper was very insightful, uh, which was uh, the interview that you did last week. Was it last week or the week before? The week before about uh, the Indian <laughs> podcast market. Yes, uh, with Gotham Rajanand, yeah. And he's coming to podcast uh, 
the podcast show in London. So I'll be good to meet Excellent. You. Yes. Excellent. Well, very much uh, looking forward to uh, that. Uh, any uh, support that you give us uh, through Value for Value, um, it just goes to Sam and uh, me. So always very grateful for all of that. So what's happened for you this week, Sam? Well, it's been a mad week. Um, you know, I've got uh, multiple hats on. So obviously I love doing this show and, and multiple interviews. So that always takes time, though. Um, I've taken on this role with the podcast standards project so I'm just getting my head around all of that and I've been reaching out to each individual host and app you know just trying to gauge where they are privately before we make some public statements so that's all fun um and obviously I've been working on tree fans as well just to keep myself busy um yeah but one of the things I'm really excited about is again going back to wave like Sam and I are talking later today um about the music genre um I, I, I love your take on this James because we, we use for podcasts when we use the Apple podcast category list, right? And and that's how we predefine, you know, what category you're in. There isn't one really for music. And what we've found is that music artists have been complaining to certainly true fans, and I'm sure Fountain and Podverse and the other apps um, are getting just the same uh, feedback, which is, you know, why can't we see um, all the people who do soul music or why can't we see the people who do rock uh, and there's no agreed list. Um, and now Sam over at Wavelix done this really good comprehensive list, which means that when we see medium equals music, we can switch the Apple podcast list out mm-hmm. and show the music genre list. So I, again, I think this list could be the one that we all uh, group around uh, and it will certainly make music discovery much better if we have a, an agreed list. So yeah, yeah. that's one well, thing I'm excited as- yeah, as long as there's a as long as there's a list that everybody agrees with, um, exactly. Then I think that that makes a bunch of sense. Um, do you know if it's a wavelength list, uh, wavelength list, or if it's a list that has come from someone else? Uh, that I don't know, but it is on GitHub, and um, they are very open to people looking at it. So uh, again, I've yeah. added a, a few categories that they had missing. Um, But it is very comprehensive. And I think, look, we've got to start somewhere. Uh, You know, if RSS Blue, um, LM Beats, uh, Wave Lake, let's say, Music Side Project, True Fans, uh, Fountain, all of us agree on that one thing, which is similar Mm. to agreeing on the Apple podcast list, which never changes, um, then at least, least, you know, we've got a starting point. Um, Otherwise, it's just going to be, uh, oh, I've got my list, you've got your list. Well, never the twain shall meet then. Mm. Um, Outside of that, um, there was that new podcast, podcast logo that you and I both liked so that was very exciting and um yeah uh, and I really liked your little chat in Germany on the future of radio James so uh, oh yes what was that yes, all about I was, this was a uh, podcast that I was in um uh, recorded while we were in uh, Munich but um uh, yes it went out uh, earlier on this week and that was quite fun and I seem to remember um saying various things while I was thinking about, um, I, th- I think, it, you know, you always know the sign of a good interview when you actually leave it going, oh, I've had a good thought there. Um, so that was quite fun in the most <laughs> echoey room available, but they had a short SM7B in there. So at least I sounded kind of okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so that was uh, that was very good. My uh, week has been mostly looking at the sorry state of the swimming pool um, which uh, turned green after lots and lots and lots of rain. Boo, swimming pool. Um, but um, honestly, such a lot of money. <laughs> such a lot of money for a thing that we hardly get into. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, so that's been fun. And lots and lots of just sort of little tweaks to the Pod News website and to various things around what, um, you know, how that thing works. I've uh, just pulled um, the last other website that was using the same code off there now, so I can properly focus on uh, stuff which um, doesn't have to work on five different websites at one point. Um, It now just has to work on the Pod News website. So uh, all of the config files going away, uh, making my life an awful lot easier. So I'm uh, quite looking forward to some quite nice faster iteration uh, in terms of what I can do with that uh, site. So that's been um, a fun thing. The most frustrating thing, and this is something that I'm sure that you're having to deal with as well, um, is uh, spotting bots who are trying to sign up for accounts, uh, or in my particular case, spotting bots trying to sign up for the newsletter. Um, 
that that's uh, that that's been a world of pain um trying to um uh, basically spot the humans and um get rid of all of that so uh, yeah that that's been taking up far too much of my time over the last couple of weeks so i'm looking forward to um uh, hopefully that code kind of working well and um, and we can move on yeah, and you, you add gamification and SATs as a reward for joining because you want to teach and help people understand how to do a boost or, or whatever they oh, may yes. be doing. And of course, our bot farms are, are started hitting us quite hard uh, in the last few weeks. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we are, we are deep in the game of whack-a-mole of trying yes. to get rid of those, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's no, never fun. Never fun. Well, that's it for this week. Um, you can also listen to the Pod News daily every single day. You can subscribe to the Pod News newsletter for more of those stories and uh, more as well. You can give feedback to James and I by sending this show a Boostergram. If your podcast app doesn't support Boost, then grab a new app from podcasting2.org forward slash apps. Our music is from Studio Dragonfly. Our voiceover is Sheila D. And we're hosted and sponsored by Buzzsprout. Podcast hosting made easy. Get updated every day. Subscribe to our newsletter at podnews.net. Tell your friends and grow the show. And support us. And support us. The Pod News Weekly Review will return next week. Keep listening. Keep listening.